In this class we want to talk about the influence of the macroeconomy. The macro environment comprises of all external forces that are out of an organization's control. Simply, there are many uh, external influences that impact on businesses, but the businesses can't control them and they can't do very much about them. They just have to let them affect them and try to deal with it whatever way they can internally. So for example, um, the government uh, may change its monetary policy so the rates of interest may increase. Well that will affect business and investment and uh, borrowing. It may uh, increase the government may increase its own borrowing, which may mean there's less available in the financial system to lend to businesses. Um, it could be that fiscal policy changes. For example, uh, the government wishes to increase taxation. That may affect businesses as well, particularly if it's corporation tax or value-added tax. Uh, it may be that the government wishes to uh, increases expenditure in some parts of the economy. That may affect the business. It may be a positive effect or a negative effect, but the fact is it does affect the business. So those are just simple examples. In fact there are many ways in which the external environment can impact on a business. Um, the most extreme is when there is a state of war between countries. That may impact on businesses. It could be exchange rate policy. Uh, it could be the labour force and shortage of skilled labour. So there are different ways in which the external environment can impact on an organisation. But when it does impact, it will have repercussions on the profitability of the business and even the survival of the business. Organizations must be able to assess macro factors and forecast future changes that may impact on their organization. Ideally, the, the management should have the equipment, the training, for example, or the resources to buy in expertise to help them to interpret the impacts that changes in the environment will have on their business so that they're able to take uh, appropriate measures to protect the business and perhaps if the external uh, issues are good and positive, which they may be, the, the company is then able to um, exploit or capitalize on these positive aspects of the external environment. So to note there that um, we talk about the changes in the external environment, they're not all bad, they could be good. For example, the government may decide to spend capital expenditure on a new transport system in an area. Well, that may benefit the business. Organizations must work within the macro environment and manage changes to benefit them. The organizations have no choice but to work within the macro environment. We all live within the macro environment. And the fact that we live within uh, the macro environment means we are all subject to changes in the environment. If the government introduces a new law, it will affect us all, perhaps. There's nothing as individuals we can do about that. The government may change the taxation rate, as I said, and we may end up paying more tax. But again, there's very little we can do about it. So the organization must work within the macro environment and must try to make the best of the situation that it faces. Now, here are some of the factors that can impact on business activity, and I'll talk about these in a little more detail in the later slides. I'm just going to go through a list at the moment just to outline what we're going to deal with. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the impact uh, of the digital revolution, the impact of social technology, cyberspace security, 
BRICS markets, and I'll explain what I mean by that later. Global shift in economic and social power. Uh, ethical and sustainable growth. Now let's talk about the uh, digital revolution for a moment. We think about the digital revolution as something new, but in fact it's been around for a long time. Um, but it does impact on businesses and it's increasingly impacting on businesses because there's more empowerment of the customer. The customer knows the price of the product, knows what the competitors are charging, can access their websites, read about the design of the product, its attributes, where it's available, what discounts are available. Uh, it does have an impact on the business. The digital revolution is the advancement in technology the shift from electronic and mechanical devices to digital technology. And that is a big jump for, for business. Now, in the world in which we live today, most businesses have adjusted to this. Uh, most businesses are able to exploit the possibilities that the digital revolution has uh, presented to them. But there are downsides associated with the digital revolution as well. Perhaps um, the loss of the personal touch, small businesses, um, the more family-run organizations, which is much more attuned to the needs of the local customers. Now, digital selling is on a global scale. We'll talk more about that in a moment. but. Organizations operating in the digital age are heavily reliant on technology for production and logistics. Companies must understand digital technology if they're going to compete effectively. Um, distribution and logistics is largely now controlled by computers. But so also, uh, it may be the case that within the company there will be computer computer-aided manufacturing. And in addition, the, the labor force will be monitored and looked after by the Human Resource Department, who will have databases of all of the factors relating to the, to the workforce. Um, marketing will want to present the product electronically online and place advertisements online. Um, the marketing personnel will also want to present a very positive image of the organization through their website. So in other words, um, electronic media is not alien to modern business. Far from it. Modern business and electronic and digital technology go hand in hand. Technology advancements enable organizations to offer efficient and reliable products and services. There's more information flowing. Um, customers are able to give instant feedback on the product. And they're also able to um, feedback negatively uh, in uh, some of the social media sites and I'll talk about that in a few moments. So it's important that the company monitor its own standards, monitor its quality and monitor the product that it's delivering to ensure that the customers are happy with their purchases. So technology is not something which is um, done by academics or done in obscure research departments. Technology is everywhere and by the time this video has, uh, has reached the internet there will be even more um, intrusion of technology into business life. And it's not large businesses only, it's medium size and small size businesses. The, the corner store may have a lot of computer-aided um, uh, technology 
at its disposal in just monitoring its stock and giving it some sort of breakdown as to what's selling. Whereas in the past that would have been done by pen and paper or even more still by somebody's memory recalling that this item was selling well and that item's not selling so well. Regular stock takes perhaps. So every day there is more and deeper penetration of technology into business life. Now the impact of social technology, well social technology are software programs which they deal with social interactions. Here we think of Facebook and um, facilities and applications such as those. Um, they are very important for businesses. I mentioned it earlier briefly but if uh, if customers are talking on Facebook about a product and given their experiences of using the product and what they felt about it and the value for money and its design, its efficiency, uh, its durability and its quality and, and, and the aftercare service that they receive from the company. If they discuss that, but if they discuss it in a negative way that can be very injurious to the business. That can affect the business badly. So it's important that the companies monitor social media to see if they're being mentioned and if they are being mentioned negatively that they're able to put their side of the, the case, their, their arguments forward to explain what happened and what they were doing about it. These technologies are in place to improve social communication in organizations and amongst people developing social networks. So companies also can discuss uh, in different forums about products or markets or um, just discuss the wider business environment or macro environment. Um, not so long ago they would have to go to the local chamber of commerce to attend meetings to discuss this and this would probably be once a month or so. But now they may be able to discuss it once a week or even every day if they wished and put forward their case as to why government should do this or should do that and what local governments are doing and and so on and so on. So there's more uh, discussion um, taking place online. Social technology has changed society and working practices. For example, clear communication due to improved software facilities. Well, society has changed. Uh, we are now able to speak to people on the other side of the world um, almost for free. Um, well, to most people it would be free since a lot of people won't have to pay directly for the internet connection. But uh, it, it's, it has in itself is a revolution. We are now aware of what's happening right around the world because of news media. And we are totally informed about the world and what's happening in it. Uh, 100, 150 years ago, we would have to wait months and months to find out what was happening. And even then, the information would not be very detailed and perhaps would not be very accurate. So, social media has changed society. But it's changed also the way we, um, the way we shop. We may shop online. We may bank online. We may um, communicate with each other online and send emails as opposed to posting a letter. Um, there are many ways in which society has changed as a consequence of social technology or uh, ty this type of technology. So that's an influence of the macro environment. There's nothing a company can do about this. Um, this is simply happening irrespective of what we feel about it. 
This is a process. We also have cyberspace security. Uh, this has become a growing concern for individuals, corporations, governments and society. Um, why it happens is difficult to explain, but some people just simply like to cause mayhem if they can do it. So they will write a virus and put it into uh, a cyberspace where it will damage computers and records and databases and and cost a lot. Um, some in the past seem to do it just for the, the sake of doing it. Uh, more recently we have ransomware that has affected parts of the National Health Service in the UK but has affected uh, companies and individuals in America and Russia uh, right throughout the world even in China and uh, other parts of the world and ransomware is more straightforward in the sense that it's there is an objective the objective is to lock the computer and to then claim a sum of money to unlock it so it's um, it's extortion it's robbery and it's not done with any ideology in mind it's simply criminals trying to um, extract money from the business community and from individuals. Advancements in technology has uh, posed internet security risks uh, making everyone vulnerable to external threats and that is one of the problems we face that as we have become more computerized we depend on computers now for our traffic lights and for our hospital services schools need uh, computers to keep records and to uh, um, make sure that the administration of the school is is efficient. Companies have computers for efficiency in communications as I said earlier. So we all use computers but that also makes us more vulnerable. So this is an issue that is ongoing and it's difficult to see where this one will stop. But for example, TalkTalk Talk and many organizations have been victims of hacking and data security threats. Now I just picked TalkTalk Talk as an example of a company that was attacked. But more recently, as I said, the National Health Service and uh, uh, so on. There are many companies right throughout the world who have been attacked. Um, there are allegations in America that some countries have influenced elections through the means of um, computer infiltration. Whether that's true or not, difficult to say, but, but the fact is uh, it's plausible because computers are vulnerable. And once the so-called back door on a computer program has been found, then of course it is open and it's possible to alter the code or to place a virus or do whatever they want to do. So we are more vulnerable, that's the point, as a consequence of computers. We also have within the macro environment the BRICS market. Now I included this because um, it's important and it's becoming more important. BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. So these countries are predicted to be the next powerhouses and the emerging markets. If we go back about 50 years, China was a mystery to most people and it was seen as very agrarian, very simple. Um, people worked on the land. Um, quite a poor country, but not today. Today it is becoming a powerhouse within the, lo the global economy. We used to think of America as the number one country, but it's only a matter of time, if it already hasn't happened, that India and China and Russia, with vast resources, will step up and become world leaders. Uh, if we go back 200 years ago or 
300 years ago, uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, ruled the seas. Not today. Uh, once upon a time, the atlas for most school children in a, in a school was coloured red to show the British Empire, which stretched all the way around the world. Not today. So just as countries have become very powerful and then waned and become quite weak and, and um, declined, other countries get powerful. And this is where the emerging markets are starting to show themselves. Uh, we now know the importance of dealing with China and trading with China. We know the importance of trading with Russia and with Brazil and India and so on, South Africa. We know this. So these are the countries that are coming up. They are developing. The rise of these powerhouses will be the next industrial countries providing a vast labour market and greater global interaction. Uh, many countries, for example the United Kingdom, has become service based. Again, if we go back, let's say, not too far, perhaps 50 or even 100 years, go back that far, the United Kingdom was an industrial country. Today it's service based. Today it buys in from the rest of the world and designs products and gets them produced overseas and takes them back to, to the United Kingdom and trades the products. But the production, by and large, is moving out. And it's moving out to countries like India, like China. It's been Outsourced is the term used, but it's it's more wholesale uh, than that. It's entire uh, production is taking place in other markets, in other countries, and then the items are imported. And <coughs> maybe that's the way the the world is going to move. It's difficult to crystal ball gaze on this, but um, maybe that's what's happening. The rise of these markets will add more strain on environmental and fuel emissions. Well, it's clearly the case that the Earth is struggling to cope with the population that we've got at the moment. The Earth is also struggling because of the pollution that we're causing in the rivers, the streams, the, the oceans, the amount of plastic we put into the ocean, um, but the amount of toxic... Uh, uh, fumes we put into the atmosphere. So as we develop more and more there's going to be more pressure on on the earth and on the climate. And that again is a problem that we're facing but it's in the macro environment. It's argued that each of us can do something about it by amending the way we work or where we live. And that is true. But it needs a mass of uh, goodwill on the part of governments and citizens right around the world to make an impact that's going to save the planet. The global shift in economic and social power will uh, there will be a shift in economic and social power as emerging emerging uh, economies, the, the BRIC countries I just mentioned, continue to grow and strengthen. So, as I said earlier, it's likely to be the case that um, centres of influence will move away from America, move away from the United Kingdom, move away from Europe towards these other countries. Uh, because they will become more and more powerful. The emerging markets will gain more control of economic power compared to Western countries. Well, we think of large countries having more natural resources. We think of large countries also um, having greater populations. So it's easy to imagine that they will start to control markets. 
the impacts on business as uh, they will have to assess growth opportunities and invest in countries which provide most benefits. And that's already happening. Businesses are starting to invest in these larger countries. Um, the, Indi uh, the Indian and the Chinese revolution, industrial revolution, if you call it that, over the last maybe 30, 40 years, was partially driven by the amount of outsourcing from the West because it was cheaper to produce in those countries because wage levels were cheaper and people who worked there perhaps didn't have uh, the support or the protection of um, at, the, uh, at the same level as say the trade unions had negotiated in the West or governments had um, legislated for in the West. So the the primer for the industrial revolution in those countries was outsourcing and it could be argued that, that was the case. Now ethical and sustainable growth, well there is a greater need to source products ethically with minimal impacts on nat uh, natural resources. Greater need because the world is heating up. Um, the polar caps are melting and with those the sea levels are increasing. Um, some islands, Tuvalu for example, is just about completely covered in water and the people of Tuvalu have had to leave and I think they've moved to um, New Zealand. But their country has been destroyed. There are many low-lying countries in the world who will feel this impact if the seas continue to rise. But also the air that we breathe has been affected and we need to find ways in which we can live our lives, our modern day lives, but with minimal impact on the uh, environment. For example, fracking and limited resource, um, resources such as petrol, these are affected by the amount of growth that we have. We want more economic growth because it gives us a higher standard of living. But higher amount of economic growth also helps to destroy the planet. So paradoxically, we may benefit in the short run from having uh, a better standard of living because of economic growth but in the long run we suffer because we have helped to uh, destroy the, the climate, um, to change the, the weather patterns on the world, to uh, pollute the seas. So perhaps when we talk about growth being a good thing we need to bear in mind that there is a downside Organizations must innovate and find ways to deliver products which protect the environment. They must be sustainable. We must recycle. We haven't got an infinite supply of raw materials that we can just throw away, packaging that we open, look at once and then dispose of. So we have issues that needs to be addressed. And these are all in the macro environment and there's very little companies can do about them. We, as, as individual companies they can try to have sustainability, they tr can try to be efficient in their use of energy and resources. Um, but it does require a greater amount of global effort to make an impact that's ultimately going to save all of us and save the planet. <coughs> well, that's all we're going to deal with in this <coughs> rather depressing talk, but um, let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching. <coughs>